Hi, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is, uh, I think, my second trip to Bendigo. I was here in, I think it was about 2008, for the uh, premier Australian sheep and wool show, Sheep Bension. Kidding. Uh, <laughs> of course, the Australian sheep and wool, wool show in Bendigo, and I'm uh, pleased to be back in the middle of winter and enjoying the, uh, enjoying the beautiful crisp morning. Um, as uh, Jason mentioned, I work at Rabobank in a research team of about 80 analysts worldwide. We're a global bank that's focused solely on food and agriculture. And as such, it is an incredibly credible, important pillar of, uh, of our bank is the knowledge function. Um, we supply knowledge both to our clients as well as internally to make sure that we're abreast of what's happening in, in the key sectors in which we service. Um, and, and I think critically the global factor of this is, is particularly important um, with analysts in both competing producer markets as well as uh, our, our end consumer markets, which is, uh, gives us a, a unique take on what's happening around the world. Um, today, we'll take a little look of the current state of play in the wool market, where we've, where we've kind of come to in the last 12 months. Um, I'll give you an outlook, John, thanks for the uh, segue there, uh, and, uh, and, and, and sort of what's been happening. We'll then look a little bit about the fact that wool, uh, and particularly is showing up at the minute, that it really isn't, uh, isn't just wool, and we're seeing a lot of variation in, in the different types and the different end, end uses for those. Um, and through the cycle, um, uh, what, what challenges your consumers are, and opportunities your consumers have, your supply chain, and, and of course, uh, for you guys as growers, um, what's next on the, on the page for there? <clears throat> I think um, John set this up quite nicely uh, in terms of establishing a, a, a business that is resilient, that is structured, that is on a path in which you're, you're sort of focused and, and directed on, is a really, really critical part of, of operating a, an agricultural business, without doubt. Um, it, it allows you to understand what vehicle you're in, what road you're driving, what corners are ahead. And then we have a little thing called markets, which can quickly see your very nice Sunday afternoon drive uh, very quickly turned around. And I think at the minute, um, with what's going on around the world, there is no, no better time to be talking about that particular volatility and that uncertainty that we're seeing in markets. Um, we have uh, Donald Trump um, on his way in. We have Britain on their way out. Um, we have China slowing and we have commodity prices not really knowing if they're coming or going at the minute, going up and down. It's a very volatile world and I, I think in terms of where we're sitting at it's important to understand what's driving those markets and, and how that's impacting what you guys are doing on, on farm as well. Um, this was a slide I used a couple of months ago which looks at the year-on-year -year change of uh, a whole basket of commodities in their futures market in the US, um, which was a fairly depressing picture year-on-year -year from February through to January 2015. When we fast forward that uh, just a couple of months um, down the track, there's been a pretty a benchmarked against exactly the same date. There's been a pretty significant change. We've seen massive rallies, particularly in sugar, soybeans, wheat, um, corn, which have all been uh, in, in, it has changed the the picture incredibly. Um, having had a year of very strong US dollar, high stocks of a lot of global commodities, um, we have seen a lot of pressure on on those prices um, and recently we've seen a lot of speculators jumping into these markets um, as, as a, a bit of a safer haven than, than other uh, money focused markets and with the uncertainty happening around the world. Um, Wool, however, has had a little bit of a different path. Um, in Australian dollar terms, it's very clear to see the outperformance and, and we certainly have, have enjoyed um, a, a pretty robust season of 2015-16 with only a couple of weeks there with the EMI under 1,200 cents. Um, but I think even in US dollar terms, and that's the, the for, for those at the back, it might be a bit hard to read, but the green line, it's still sitting above a lot of the other competing indices in terms of the food prices, the S&P agri, and, and when we look at oil prices, it's significantly above. Um, so I think that's important to, uh, I guess, put in perspective of, of where wool and the path that wool has been tracking over the last 12 months or so versus the, the world and the, 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 um, the, the other markets in which uh, agriculture is featured. Um, 
In terms of what that's doing, and, and uh, it's certainly in the fibre market, we've seen a continual rise in the gap between the price of wool and the price of its competing fibres. Um, the pressure on synthetic prices has been pretty pretty great over the last 12 months. We've had low oil prices. We have a significant overcapacity of polyester production facilities, in uh, particularly in China, um, and, and that has placed um, a, a Fairly, fairly downward trend on, on what we're seeing synthetic and competing synthetic fibres. Cotton uh, has been facing a, a stockpile of about a year's worth of global use um, over the last 18 months, um, most of which is held in China, about 60%, and they've only recently in the last six to, 12, six to eight weeks started reserve um, auctions to actually get through that stockpile. Um, and so what we've seen in the cotton market is also an incredibly depressed price over the last last 18 months, um, whereby we, we were had been tracking it at <clears throat> pretty comfortably around 80 cents a pound, um, and, and which has now, now been sitting in a band of 58 to 60 six currently uh, with the last rally. So those those prices and that pressure on that price, it kind of makes wool's performance even that little bit better in terms of the environment of the, the textile supply chain and the competing fibre operations. And I think when we think about what has been the, the critical factors here and, and currency is without doubt number one, we had a look at that US dollar, Australian dollar um, uh, version there and, and I, I highly uh, understand that every, every week a wool market report drops drops into your inbox and, and you're looking at the fact that the dollar is up and down and that's what's it. But the, the, the relationship between that dollar and the, and the wool price in the last little while has been extraordinarily strong. Um, and we're seeing very, very much pressure placed when we tick up a cent or two, which we have in the last um, little while, and when we drop a cent or two, which is, which is eased off, which has kept us trading in that 1,200 cent to 1,300 cent mark for most of the year. The low world wool supply is, um, is certainly something that's front of mind. I think when you're talking with Australian growers, we're, we're certainly very well aware of the fact that our flock has, has dropped considerably over the last 25 years. Um, we're, we're sitting at about 70 million head and looking at a 7% produ uh, production um, decrease this year in 2015-16. In um, around the world, the situation is, has been in all of the major wool producing countries um, or wool exporting countries has been the same. New Zealand has halved, basically halved its flock as well over the same period as, as the conversion to dairy has, uh, has, has taken control. I think that's slowed a little bit in the last 12 months or so. But, the, but things have been very tough for sheep producers over there, both from a lamb price perspective and a wool price for quite some time. And, and we've seen the, the numbers there um, is significantly eroded. Um, in terms of production out of South America, the same story has been applied. Uh, Uruguay, Argentina have all both seen significant flock decreases. Um, the the uh, one outlier here, which is an interesting one, is China, um, which has certainly seen a, a growth in both their sheep population and, and their wool um, production to a different degree. But, but the end of the market in which they operate is very different and, and fairly uncompetitive in terms of where Australian wool is exported and the products that it goes into at this point. The other key factor, and this is something that we'll get into, is some of the key demand drivers that are, have seen, um, I, I think, I say I was, I was in Bendigo, it was probably about 2008. The EMI was sitting at about 860 cents um, at that point in time, and the, the 17 micron indicator was, uh, was at around 1,500 cents. Today, we're, we're sitting at, at about 1,290 cents for the EMI and about 1,500 cents for the 17 micron indicator. There have been some significant shifts in terms of what we've seen in, as, as in supply, um, but also in, in demand trends and, and what's been pushing the market in other directions as well. Um, so taking a little look at that, and, and, and wool really isn't homogenous, and I, I think this gets overlooked a, a lot of the time when we're, we're talking about, particularly when we, we spend a lot of time in markets talking about the EMI as a, as a benchmark. Um, you guys as, as growers, and, and unfortunately our marketing team sometimes have a bit of trouble telling the difference, but, um, but, but you're looking, when you're looking at your sheep, you understand critical differences in how they operate and what they look like and what they're producing and how they're producing it. They've all got very different characteristics and very different attributes at the end of the day. And, and in particular, 
that fibre is, is in exactly the same boat. Um, when you're looking to make a suit, you're looking for something that's a, a fibre and a fibre performance that's very different to what you're looking to, for when you're looking to make a blanket. Um, when you're looking to make a, a highly breathable dress, for example, you might also be looking for something completely different. But, but in terms of those characteristics and, and those attributes, why we have different demand trends affecting different types of wool is, is really down to the fact that you have a demand drive, a, a jumper is going to look for something very different to what you're getting out of when you're making a suit. And I, and I think it's really critical to think of wool um, not just as, as wool, um, but, but certainly as what it, what it is transformed into and, and where the demand is for those underlying products. Um, and I think it's pretty clear to see over the last uh, 10 years or so, um, there have been some significantly stronger performing segments. Um, merino cardings uh, and lamb's wool carding, shorter wools have been performing well um, in incredibly, particularly through the last couple of years. But as we can see, that, that upturn has, has really started um, uh, almost a decade ago. Now that shorter wool goes into the wool and processing system. It heads into jumpers, into knitwear, into outerwear, which have all been segments that have been experiencing growth um, and, and solid growth and, and good demand. Um, and, and I think that in terms of where the supply chain is placed, we're still seeing interest and in orders for that, that type of, uh, be it open top, be it noils through the top making system, be it, be it locks and crutchings at the growing system, we're seeing a lot of demand for those types of wool. Um, New Zealand have had incredibly strong lamb, lambs wool prices as well over the last um, couple of years and second shears has, have, have, have performed incredibly well um, and and I think in terms of that that kind of market and, and that kind of performance has just really um, underlined it's not been a, a, a solely a supply story um, we have seen supply kick back with the, the the drop in in supply more broadly in the country but in terms of uh, it, it is it is heavily driven whether you're looking at it in Australian dollar terms or US dollar terms we're seeing really strong performance for that type of wool um, when we bring that down to the crossbred level at 28 micron wool, we've also seen a very strong year last year. Um, prices have certainly softened and, and come back to a range. But when we th when we compare that with, say, the five years leading up to 2011 versus the five years post-2011, um, we're looking at a really strong um, sort of performance for that for that end of the market. And that is not on less supply. That is, again, on, on fairly consistent, if not slightly increasing for some of the 28 micron wool in terms of volume that we've got on offer. Um, and, and we've still seen an, a, a pretty strong performing um, fibre prices. Again, products like outerwear, like overcoats, um, that have had a, a lot of heat um, and a lot of discussion in the marketplace. And I, I'm sure you, you read and heard and we've spoken to a lot about the double face fabric last year um, that, that saw the crossbred prices and the carding prices take that spike that they did in June. Um, and, and I, but I think those kinds, of, um, those kinds of demand spikes are really encouraging for wool because it's, it's actually showing that the, 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 it is a story of, of demand and it's a story of our consumers and our supply chain pulling that fibre through the, through the way. In terms of where we're sitting from a, a, a fine wool perspective, um, and, and this is something that we'll start to have a little look at the, the flock dynamics more, because it is a little a far more of a supply story. Um, while prices have, have certainly uh, improved and, and taken some of the advantage that, that the, the, the market overall has seen over the last little while, um, it, it certainly hasn't performed to the same level as other types. Um, and that is um, absolutely heavily, heavily dependent on the supply situation. When we look at the merino clip in Australia over the last 25 years, we've obviously seen a, a, a pretty uh, sort of stark decline in, in volume, which is pretty clear. But we've also seen a very, change, a very changed profile of the clip. And when, when we take that to the last 10 years, which is a bit more steady in terms of volume, uh, interestingly, um, but in terms of that increase in production of 17 and 16 micron wool, which hasn't yet stopped. Um, this year, as I said, we're looking at a 7% reduction in, in Australian wool overall and, and wool tested to date. We've still had an uptick in, in 16 micron or 16.5 micron and finer uh, and, an up, and a slight uptick in, in 17 micron. That volume hasn't started to be taken out of the market um, and, and we're seeing a significant uh, decline in that mid micron um, area, which is why I think we're seeing some of that price shift and those premiums tighten. Um, it's been a very different story over the last four years when we talk 
talking about premiums for different types of wool. And, and yes, it's a story of a fairly reasonably flat curve for the, for the finer types, but it's also been, as the supply has come out of the market for the 21s, 22s, 23s, that those types of prices have increased at a, at a more rapid rate and tightened that gap between what you're being paid for that fibre. Again, finding the end market for the 17 micron and the and finer wool has been a little bit of a challenge. Um, I think post, post GFC, um, we've, we've seen the woven sector battling a little bit uh, in terms of men's suiting, women's suiting has all but evaporated in terms of an end market. Um, and, and we're seeing a, a shift in how that operates. Now there are fantastic opportunities in different sectors for fine wool. And I think that these are being explored by both processes, um, manufacturers, supply chains, certainly with the, the, the marketing organisations, but in terms of um, in, in terms of where we're sitting today, it has been a little bit harder to move, a little bit harder to, to guarantee those premiums at the levels that we saw pre-2011, given the higher supply and the lack of supply of the other types. Um, the other key factor in the in the sheep market has has really been the strong lamb prices and and its impact on on what our flock looks like and and what we're seeing there and and I think uh, and I'm I'm not a protein specialist but certainly from um, from our perspective the the optimism in that market is, is fairly well maintained and, and looking fairly robust as I mentioned New Zealand haven't had the best time um, or haven't had nearly as good a time as the Australian sheep industry over the last couple of years. Um, their lamb prices have been significantly impacted by a reduction in imports, um, particularly into, by China, um, whereas Australia has been buffered with a really reasonably strong domestic market um, and a pretty diverse export profile. Um, we've had strong exports into the Middle East, we've had strong, uh, reasonable exports into China, um, and, our, and our markets elsewhere have, have held up, um, which, is, which has seen lamb prices hold on to where they are, um, and, and wool prices perform pretty well. And, and and, and resulting effect is obviously a, a pretty um, a robust sheep industry for the last 12, or 12 months to two years. Um, I think, interestingly, where the where the flock goes, and and um, I'll certainly be interested to be talking with you guys through the day about where your decisions are at, because it, it's it's been a very interesting trend as we've seen the merino ewe population um, continue its its decline, um, and and AWI certainly produced some uh, some fairly stark kind of predictions in their wool selling systems review um, recently that if we were to continue on trend in a couple of years, we would be looking at about a 30% of the lamb population being pure merinos, which is um, a long way from a long way from the 50% um, that, that we're sitting at and, and certainly a long way from, from where we have been in the past. Um, I, I think traditionally before 08 or 09, we'd been looking at ewes that were um, about 85% pure merino and it's currently sitting at around 50%. So it's a it, it's been a very interesting trend and, and I think something that potentially uh, the, the strength in some of the wool prices that we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months have the ability to impact that. But on the other hand, we've seen very strong land prices at the same time and, and some very interesting decisions for you guys to, to come, come to now as to what production systems are going to work best for you guys on, on your farms. I think... Um, from the supply side of things, uh, that, that's certainly been the picture. But uh, it, it's been an interesting development in terms of what how we've seen um, consumers operate and 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 things happen at the other end of the chain. Um, we've transitioned over a period from a very bespoke, um, personalised way to buy clothes to a very mass market and 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 cheap. Um, uh, retail environment to try and get volume and, and quantity out the door. Um, that has really shifted in recent times and I think this was summed up pretty well by Uniqlo which is the largest um, uh, retail, uh, specialist apparel retailer in Japan. And they were had to have very clear statement that in the in the last decade their focus and their transition has gone from being a low cost retailer um, to being a high value retailer. And I think that critical point on value is important. These brands are, are, are cheap, um, they're fast fashion, they're they're mass market, but they are looking for a lot more with every product that they put on the shelves. Now, be that a story about traceability, be that a story about sustainability. Um, we've had H and have incredibly strong targets um, around their uh, their sustainability practices. Um, they're, they're aiming for 100% of their cotton to be um, be sourced sustainably, 
which is uh, under their guidelines, either um, a better cotton initiative program, which in an Australian terms means having a better management program on farms um, through uh, organic cotton or through recycled cotton. Um, and, and I think that being, you, you will still go in there, you will still have a very cheap product, you will still have a lot of product coming onto shelves, but there is a lot more consciousness about how, what that product represents and, and what value proposition that offers a consumer. Um, and this isn't something that is in fashion or clothing alone. And I think, interestingly, one of our analysts um, did a, a report a couple of years ago out of the US, um, which uh, highlighted the shrinking premium between prime cut um, steak and, and, and beef products um, and ground beef. And basically, the, the growth in uh, in ground beef consumption by, by the US US consumer over the last 40 years or so. Now, uh, in in one way, it's not that the the prime cut has has taken a dip in the market. Again, it has been that the other the the higher demand has has lifted prices and lifted op options for that ground beef market to to tighten that margin and tighten that premium. And again, it was a transition that started from uh, a, a smaller cafe restaurant food service type operation into a fast food mass market, cheap, uh, low cost model, which has transitioned. Um, we're starting to see strong growth in a, in a, a segment that they'll call um, fast casual. Um, but we're seeing um, burger chains that are performing incredibly strongly. I think Shake Shack was the number one performer in, in that market last year. Um, and with a 59% with a increase in the value of their sales in, in just 12 months. Uh, and I think that kind of growth in that market, again, they're not looking for a low cost um, product uh, and, and sold on the basis of being a, a low cost product. They're looking to sell a, a, a burger at the fact that it's hormone free, that it is potentially grass fed, which offers opportunities for Australian lean beef, um, but, but that it has the attributes that the consumer would like, but it's in a, in a convenient form, in a, in a, uh, a form that, it, that, that attracts, attracts that type of consumer and continues their growth pattern through. And I, I think think that that's a, it's an interesting comparison to make, particularly for wool, um, to look at other segments are, are facing similar challenges. Um, again, it isn't necessarily, and, and I'd like to highlight, it isn't necessarily about the fact that that premium product is any less enjoyed, any less important, or any less, uh, I, I guess, revered um, in terms of uh, maximising the, the quality of that, um, but it is also about meeting where that demand is. And interestingly, one of the key takeaways from the research was what the US production system should be doing to match this trend. Um, how do they, in a, in a system that is highly geared towards producing premium beef, um, be it through feedlotting and, 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 and feeding um, regimes, is that the right way to meet the growth in the other demand? And, and I think that's just an interesting question to have in terms of, from a, a sheep producer perspective, is are our production systems and what we're doing, and, and we can be awfully controversial here if we'd like to get into uh, skirting, non-skirting, other bits and pieces, but but, but think Thinking about where is the end product going? What is the what is the demand profile um, of that of that particular product, and how can we be the most efficient producers to get that product to market? Um, through the cycle, and look, I've uh, I've done this um, I, initially when I, I put this together. I had it in the other direction, which is often the way Australian wool growers think in terms of what am I doing, what's my supply chain doing, and then what's the consumer, what's happening at the consumer end. And I'm going to flip it around this week, uh, this time, because I, I think it's um it, it's really important to actually start at that end and work back to to then okay, well, well, what what decisions are you going to be making? You've got a lot of information coming at you today to to help you with that. Um, and, and, but, but if we start with the basis of this is what's happening um, downstream and, and, and work from there. Um, now, it's, it's a pretty challenging prospect for a wool grower in Australia, um, in, in, be it in Bendigo, be it in, uh, in, in Dubbo, be it in, in uh, uh, Adelaide <laughs> or Adelaide Hills. Uh, it, it's a very complex uh, sort of thing reading consumers. And I, and I think this quote pretty well sums it up when it's said by the CEO of one of the biggest fashion brands, 
um, and, and heaven knows what their research, market research budget would be and what, what, what advisors they have coming at them. Um, but but in a couple of years ago with the arrival and the, the growth of the athleisure market uh, and, and certainly the, uh, the athletic market, we have a, a CEO of Levi's um, saying we're scrambling. Um, uh, we've basically, the, there is a big difference between the product that we've got on the floor today uh, and what the consumer is looking for. And we've flat out missed it, which is a pretty strongly worded statement for a, for a large brand and, 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 into, and a very successful brand in terms of how they developed their products and, and taken different, different technologies and different innovation to market. Um, so it is a challenge and, and I, I think that there are a number of directions um, in, in which to look at this. Um, we often talk about the falling, um, uh, the, the, the sort of falling market share of, of, of wool and, and, and cotton in terms of the fibre market. Um, and interestingly, I think it's, it's also important to see how that relates because of the growth of synthetics and the growth of far cheaper synthetics, as we've seen uh, in, the, in the previous price slides. We've seen a, a, a very much a, a strong decline in terms of the, the real price um, prices paid for, for fibres, um, but we've seen a really strong increase in the per capita consumption of fibres. Um, so in terms of the, the demand profile, there's a lot more fibre consumed, there's a lot more fibre needed in the world. Um, that is an apparel story, that is also an industrial story, and the, the more automobiles we have, the more buildings we have, the more fibre that's used in, in those types of markets as well. Um, but, but it is an interesting one, and I, I think um, there's certainly, and, and there was some interesting statistics that came out of the International Wool and Textiles Organisation conference earlier this year in Sydney around where that premium market sits and, and their willingness and the growth of those, those consumers out there that are willing to pay more um, and, and willing to uh, pay more for a product that they believe offers them better value. And, and that, that market is clearly going to grow. It, it, it's lifting by about 33% in terms of people. Um, it's lifting by about 41 or 44% in, in terms of the value that it offers. Um, but and, and that is a, an important fact for wool um, in, in terms of looking and seeking that consumer that is prepared to pay a little bit more as, as we've seen that price differential is quite wide. Um, but, but in terms of that mass market growth, um, it has generally over the last couple of decades been expected to come at a reduced price. Uh, which is, is just an interesting, um, also, I, I think, way to, to look at things. The other things is around, uh, in terms of where, where we're seeing consumer, and, and we spoke a little bit around the, uh, the, the demand and, and consumer trawl, but it, it's really um, how we're thinking about what the consumer wants and how they're doing it. It is seeing how, diff changing the way farming is operating. We're seeing um, sorghum here listed as a superfood, and it's been a pretty cracking superfood for cattle for quite some time, but it's now advertised on a cereal box as being exactly what someone um, potentially with wheat intolerance needs in, in order to get the the, uh, um, the, the vitamins and, and, and uh, the performance on further than that. We're seeing um, beef briskets, lamb, there's not often I speak to a sheep farmer that, that is astonished at the price of lamb shanks in the supermarket versus what they, what they cut at home and what they used to give to the dogs. That kind of demand-driven consumer is incredibly, um, incredibly strong, and, and again, it's about listening to those messages. And, and from a, a wool perspective, if it's overcoats, if it's uh, if it's jumpers, if it is um, sneakers, those options that are out there. What are we doing at this end of the supply chain to meet that demand at the end of the chain? In terms of the supply chain, um, and, and they are facing significant challenges as well, without doubt. We've got fast fashion, which is requiring um, a, a significant uh, sort of uh, expedition of getting a product from fibre form to end garment form. Um, what we were looking at in terms of a traditional wool supply chain that fitted in quite nicely with a summer order, a winter order, a six-month time period in between in which to export the wool, get it processed, get it made into a, made into a garment and, and distribute it elsewhere. H&M, for example, um, will be looking at, at, at uh, on occasion, um, getting a design from their offices into a store within three weeks. Now, that needs to rapidly shift how the supply chain is able to respond to that. We're seeing some, so certainly some mills in China, uh, from a wool perspective, are vertically integrating and they are making some of those faster responses possible. But we're still, as a natural fibre, um, and, and the ability 
to get that wool through the supply chain through the six or seven steps that it takes to get there is a challenge ahead in terms of how how brands are operating and the speed at which the fashion supply chain is operating. In terms of the costs of labour, China is under pressure significantly in their manufacturing sector. Um, it's not been a news story. It's certainly not to continue. Uh, it certainly looks like continuing as their their focus on um, higher value manufacturing uh, continues to grow. Um, and, and I think interestingly, while we will see and we are starting to see um, some divestment in terms of where textiles are produced and the different countries that are growing rapidly. China will remain, and particularly for wool, it will remain the core of, of where wool production happens in the near term. Um, downstream where we are absolutely seeing Bangladesh, Vietnam come online and and, and 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 that switch to a lower cost manufacturing environment happen. Um, but but certainly um, we, we see that the that that early stage processing is is heavily embedded in China in the in the near term. Environmental regulations as as with anything are also getting tighter and tougher to manage. Um, I think the other critical thing and, and this is a, interestingly it came out at the, the RWTO conference as well but when we think about wool and, and I've, I've marketed wool and I've spoken to, to retailers and brands about wool and, and it's a very easy story and it's a great story in terms of it's, it's, it's a natural fibre, it's sustainable, it's biodegradable, it ticks a lot of boxes on the environment and there's, uh, we've got a speaker from NZM coming um, shortly and, and hopefully he'll, he'll talk a little bit about some of the work that they're doing around life cycle but the, the uh, justification of those attributes is, is becoming increasingly important and our competitors aren't standing still still. Um, we, we have are happily sitting tarnishing um, synthetic fibres for, for being a, a petroleum based, um, certainly not environmentally friendly and certainly contributing to a lot of the waste problem that we have in terms of fibre fiber wastage around the world. They are not standing still on what they're doing from a sustainability accreditation process. Brands are working with them to, to grow um, that, that sustainability story, to recycle plastic water bottles and, and and transform it into fibres and, and, and to, into T-shirts, um, to recycle clothing, to have depots where people can drop their old clothes. They are working um, at, to sustainability uh, accreditation just the same as what we are doing. So I think it's important to understand that that, that, that natural story, it is critical and it is important and it is a, a fundamental attribute that wool has, but we need to be incredibly front on the front foot in terms of developing that story and making sure that our, our supply chains are, are on board and, and, and understanding what that means um, for, from a life cycle perspective. Um, so I uh, will be wrapping up. I've got one and a half minutes, I think. Uh, so in terms of what next for the for the wool grower and what choices, you've got a, an array of choices um, ahead of you in turn, and, and a, a lot will be discussed, no doubt, today. Um, we, while they haven't ridden as strong a path as, as some of the other indicators, there, there's probably little downside risk at the minute for what we're seeing for the, the fine, finer microns and finer um, a wool. Um, the challenge is that the upside is also pretty limited in terms of the, the amount of supply that's coming in just hasn't started turning off yet. Um, we've obviously had a, a bit of a break in weather, um, both in Queensland and Victoria over the last month or two. Um, we'll see how sustained that is and, and what impact that might have for the 2016-17 season. Um, but certainly in the near term, that, that high supply um, is likely to stay um, very much part of the market. And conversely, that low supply um, of the mid-micron indicator is certainly expected to keep um, those, those mid-micron prices reasonably strong. Um, the optimism for lambs and, and, and meat prices are certainly um, is still in play. While we've been sitting at, at reasonably high levels for a sustained period of time, it is certainly the fact that the, the protein demand, um, the, the high beef prices, um, which are leading to, to potentially the competitiveness of lamb in terms of what people are choosing in a supermarket, those kinds of factors are, are certainly leading to a pretty optimistic picture for, for where we're seeing lamb markets. Um, and, and and where we're seeing crossbred wool is an interesting one. It, it, it certainly has softened in the last 12 months um, from where we were. But again, I, I really think that that, that that section of the, the market has been performing well now for, for four or five years and, and, and holding up that end of the bargain for, the, for those of you with, uh, with crossbred operations. 
Um, so what it comes down to, and, and resilience um, is, is certainly key, um, to me it comes down to what, well, what, what decisions, here is the market background, um, here, is, here are the market opportunities, here's a lot of things to, to think about, um, but, but certainly from your end, uh, and, and as John rightly pointed out, markets will go up, markets will go down, and, and ultimately what, what gains you are able to make on your cost of production, what gains you are able to make with your weaning rates, what gains you are able to make make um, in getting more lambs on the ground, cutting more wool and, 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 and turning off faster in a lamb situation is going to lead um, to, a, to a strong business outcomes. Um, I think we've pretty well classed that up. So in, in terms of where we where we started at and, and, and where we were turned around, I think it's um it's often good when we when we think about markets and when we talk about markets and, and certainly John mentioned uh, it, it is often easy to um, interestingly and and it's been my experience as well, uh, largely in the wool industry, that you, you do talk up a market and, and say that the outlook's fabulous and the wool growers say no no it's bound to go down shortly. Um, I, I was up talking to some sugar growers um, a couple of weeks ago and, and to put this in perspective, their prices have gone from about $330 a tonne last year um, to about $580 a tonne where we're sitting today. So it's been a significant increase and so I was pretty excited to be up there talking to them. They were, everyone was in a reasonable mood and, and they, they were at $500 at the time and said, so, well, you know, this is, you know, this is much better. It's a much better outcome in terms of where you're sitting and they're like, oh, geez, I think, I think we'll hit 600. Well, <laughs> I don't, I don't, we've had it, we've had it almost doubled in, a, in the last 12 months if we, if we think we're going to take another 100. Anyway, it turns out four weeks later we're at 580 and pretty close to it. Um, but I think in terms of markets, the important thing is, is, is really perspective. It's, it's walking away, it's, it's, it's knowing that steady road, knowing that resilience of the business, knowing the vehicle that, you, that you're carting in and being prepared um, for, for what may or may not prop up. Um, and, and certainly if, if something does prop up, it's about walking away and, and sitting down and, and, and considering that perhaps it could have been a little bit worse.